All right, can you hear me? Good. So I get the distinct pleasure to be the final presentation today. And I get to talk about a topic I'm very excited about. And hopefully, if you're not familiar with this topic, you'll be excited by it uh, by the end of the day. So today I'll be talking about physiologic-based pharmacokinetic modeling and simulation used in assessing bioequivalence for generic atomic products. One of the longer titles you'll have in this workshop, but for the layman, what essentially we're trying to do is create these virtual computer-based eyes where we can simulate what happens when you directly apply these atomic products to the eye surface, how it gets absorbed and then distributed through the different ocular tissues, and eventually uh, be able to measure local concentrations without having to do any in vivo experiments. Uh, Throughout this workshop, you're going to hear three presentations that are related to PVK in different locally acting areas. This obviously being the first one, followed by two more tomorrow. Uh, so, so that we have the same baseline and we don't have to repeat, I'll start off my talk by giving an introduction to what physiologic based pharmacokinetic or PVK modeling is. Then we'll move a bit more uh, specific into how we see uh, this technology being used for locally acting products. Then I'll finally try to dive in more specifically into the atomic PVK modeling about the different research we've done in that area, defining, uh, finishing up with the different challenges and directions we're doing with our research. PVK modeling has been traditionally developed to describe how the active moiety distributes across different tissues once in systemic circulation. So you can think of this more in terms of things that have been injected directly into systemic circulation. But there's also PVK models that incorporate um, oral administrative products. Instead of just using a simple absorption rate typical of some traditional PK models, these oral PVK models include mechanistic absorption, but also describe how your dosage form transits along the GI tract and also how it releases your drug product along the GI tract as well. So the more mechanistic description of that process. A, a key feature of PVK models is that it integrates a wide rate of different information, both on the system, which here we're referring to the physiology, and also different properties of the drug substance and the drug product itself. So these information include information on the population or subpopulation physiology for human or other species of interest, your drug substance physical chemical properties, any drug in vivo interactions such as interactions with transporters or metabolic enzymes, and then finally drug product characteristics such as dissolution rate, which is a common feature you'll see in oral absorption PVK models. Um, both from companies and from the FDA, there's been many regulatory applications of PVK model. This is a busy slide. I'm not going to walk you through every single one of these applications where we won't get out of here. Um, we presented these at other conferences, so I hope you can look at other material that's around there about from the FDA on PVK modeling. But the key message I want you to take away from this is that PVK modeling can be used at multiple times during the drug development process. And it does, actually doesn't even matter if it's, it's for a new drug or, a, or for a generic. You can employ these techniques from the very beginning to aid your formulation selection. You can use these to help design what type of pharmacokinetic studies you're going to do if that's the route you have to go. And you can also use this to assess different attributes of your, of your product and determine whether or not that's appropriate even before you move into those uh, in vivo studies if that's necessary. Um, and in the future, we hope to see the PVK being able to further help support reduced testing in humans by, uh, by being able to be used in lieu of conducting any of vivo studies. Before I move on for the locally acting PVK section, I want to bring everyone's attention to this recently finalized guidance in August 2018. This is the Guidance for Industry PVK Analysis Format and Content. So if you're planning to use a PVK model for a regulatory purpose, you're eventually going to have to submit that model to the FDA. And what will greatly improve review efficiency is if everyone can follow the standardized format. So the goal of this guidance is to give industry a uh, perspective of how they should, uh, how should they produce the reports and what type of information that should contain. But one specific thing I want to call out is within the results section. I know it could be very small, but it mentions here a discussion of model verification. I just want to quickly point that out that you can't just submit the model and say, here are the results. Just like with the new in vitro method, you can't just say, we tried a new method, here are the results. You need to show us that this modeling attempt can actually describe what you're trying to use it for. Um, throughout today, we've already heard some uh, challenges with establishing bioequivalence with local acting products. I'll recap some of those. Probably one of the most important is that direct quantification of the active moiety at the site of action often is not possible. And even if it is possible, these studies sometimes are infeasible or not ethical to perform in humans. Second, that 
A lot of times, drug can be systemically measured for these locally acting products. Oftentimes, it can't be. But even when it can be measured, there's often no direct link between systemic and local drug exposure levels. In other words, even though if you're able to establish bioequivalence through systemic PK levels between your reference and test product, um, there's not much assurance that, that that conclusion will extrapolate to local uh, to concentrations at the site of the action. Pharmacodynamic and clinical endpoint studies have been used currently by the agency to assess local concentrations indirectly. Uh, but these studies have their own challenges that have been described in terms of time, cost, operations, uh, lack of sensitivity, and of course just the large number of subjects that have to uh, be enrolled in these studies that play into the cost as well. Um, and then uh, more recently we've been, uh, in our product specific guidance, we've been advocating these in vitro only B methods. But these methods uh, set a very conservative design space for generic products in that you have to, um, for all these different critical quality attributes, you have to match um, RLD pretty closely. For, for locally acting products, we follow, it's a very simple paradigm that we're trying to follow. You start with your drug product itself, which contains your drug substance, your formulation, and any critical quality attributes. In the case for inhalation or nasal products, it could also include the device performance as well. You apply this to your physiological system. You see in the, the pictures below, this could be the eye, the nose, the lung, the skin, or, or even the GI tract itself if it's a locally acting GI product. And then we, in the models, we want to directly assess what the in vivo performance is by predicting systemic and local concentrations throughout the different tissue types. Uh, today, we're talking about um, the ocular space. But tomorrow, you'll hear from Dr. Waspolanga and Dr. Althiria Sakalozu on nasal pulmonary and durable PVK models, respectively. Uh, we see multiple applications, potential applications for PVK for local acting products. Um, I kind of already briefly mentioned this in the previous slide. But we see that firms can initially use these tools to support their product development. In or, in, if you're unable to get around doing the clinical endpoint study or any in vivo study, um, you can use these tools to help gain confidence that your product that you developed um, is close to the RLD and may pass. So you, I think it's better if you have greater confidence before you have to go into these timely and cost these studies. Over time, uh, as we gain more confidence in these models, it can potentially be used in, in lieu of conducting a, these pharmacodynamic or clinical endpoint studies. One approach to doing this is to establish um, this correlation between systemic PK and local PK. This may not be possible in all cases, but in some cases it can be done. And that way, then perhaps a certain metric on the systemic PK, such as a partial AUC, could be used. Another route is to simulate a virtual bioequivalent study on both local and systemic PK based directly on your formulation inputs. A caveat to this approach is that you have to, we have to have confidence that these models are fully able to describe the formulations that you're applying to your physiological system. Um, so, um, and basically, you have to be able to describe what is different between your product and RLD. And that's what the model is going to be able to describe. And finally, we see PVK playing a role with critical quality attributes in that you can justify differences from the RLD. This, this speaks back to my previous slide when I mentioned about the conservative design space. Um, in, in this case, you can use a PVK model to establish what is the in vivo relevance of, of certain critical attributes. Perhaps they don't need to be held as tightly um, because they don't play a critical role in bioavailability, or maybe you determine that these attributes are actually, actually absolutely critical to product performance. Another, another role that PVPK can play is with guiding selection of clinically relevant and feature tests for bioequivalents such as dissolution or permeation tests. Now we're finally jumping into ocular PVK model. Simply put enough, these are models that integrate the eye anatomy and physiology and multiple different mechanisms that occur when you apply a drug to the eye surface. First is just the mechanism of drug absorption from the ocular surface for when you apply these solutions, gel suspensions, um, emulsions. Second is the mechanisms of drug distribution and clearance throughout the different ocular tissues. In 2014, we issued a general RFA based upon the limitations we saw in just broadly local okay, acting PVK models. And based upon what we have received, we awarded two grants that focus on ocular PBK, first to Simulations Plus and the second to CFD Research Corporation. And also another challenge that we saw with PBK, with PBK modeling in the ocular arena is that the data associated with humans in this area is extremely limited. And even if it is collected, you typically can only get one 
PK sample per person. Um, so most of the data that we have available is preclinical. Most of the time, they're coming from rabbits. Uh, so over the next two slides, I will briefly describe the two grants and what have and what they have accomplished, but only briefly. These slides are more here for your reference, so you can check them if you're interested later. Um, so the first is from Simulations Plus in a study titled PBK Modeling Simulation for Ocular Dosage Forms. Here they focus on developing their ocular compartmental absorption and transit model within the GASHA Plus uh, platform. And most of this work focused on autonomic suspensions. And throughout the work on the grant, they improved the model structure, which you can see on the figure on the right here. This is a compartmental-based model. Where, where each of these compartments represent different ocular tissues, and the arrows between that represent how the drug flows between those different um, tissues. The second grant is to CFD Research Corporation in a study titled Integrated Multiscale Multiphysics Modeling and Simulation of Ocular Drug Delivery with Whole Body Pharmacokinetic Response. OK, it's an extremely long title. <laughs> but uh, well, what's really unique about this approach is that it actually incorporated computational fluid dynamics, or CFD, You'll hear more about computational fluid dynamics from Dr. Boswellenga tomorrow, who will talk about how we're applying this in the inhalation and na nasal realm. But for this ocular work, it's also a compartmental-based approach, but within each compartment, it actually models the fluid transport within that compartment. Over the next few slides, I will briefly go over two internal case studies that have been conducted internally in the FDA. The first one deals with dexamethasone suspension. This was a rabbit PBK model that we developed in the OCAP module within GASHA Plus. We also internally collaborated with our labs to conduct a rabbit study where we administered dexamethasone suspension to rabbits and sampled, sampled within multiple PK and multiple ocular tissues and plasma for the model development. We also used different literature searches, sources to help uh, verify this model. In the end, we conducted parameter sensitivity analysis on the impact of particle size and viscosity on both local and systemic exposure. And as a result, we found that viscosity plays, is a critical attribute affecting bioequivalence for this type of product. But and something, that, uh, confirmed, something that was confirmatory for us is that plasma systemic PK in this situation was not reflective of local concentrations. The second case study is with cyclosporin ophthalmic emulsion. This dealt with two internally built models. One was a fluids based approach to describe tear, tear film breakup time. Apologies for the typo there which is an endpoint affected by the, the, this drug product. And the second is a carpentamental approach to predict by availability. Similar to the prior, previous study, we looked at several different quality attributes and its effect on, on by availability, and, but also in this case, this endpoint of uh, T-butt. And we found, so here we looked at surface tension, osmolality, and parallel viscosity. And we found that viscosity had the greatest influence on, on both of these outcomes. One of the major challenges going forward in using ocular PBT models in the regulatory set setting is how do you verify these models? One of the biggest issues, as I've already mentioned, is going to be data availability. In an ideal scenario, you'll have multiple formulations which differ in different, C different quality attributes, and you'll have in vivo data on either PKC endpoints such that you can establish perhaps a mechanistic IVIVC or even just a plain IVIVC. Uh, but most likely for these products, this type of data isn't available. Uh, what's probably the better, probably the approach I will have to be taken in the ocular route is this what we call a unified model approach, which is typically how PBK models are validated in the first place, in that you take multiple products with difference in the range of their drug substance properties and also the formulation properties, and you test their predictability such that when you're testing your product of interest, that hopefully it falls within the range of those other products you tested, and you'll get ensure greater confidence in those predictions. Another challenge with verification has to do with species. And as I already mentioned again, a lot of data that's available is not in humans, it's in rabbits. Uh, rabbit modeling right now, there, there's no evidence that when you simulate in a rabbit and simulate bioequivalence in a rabbit, that that conclusion will extrapolate to humans. Um, but we do see right now that there is some utility in using rabbit modeling. It can help firms inform their formulation selection before they have to perform the clinical study in humans, because right now there's no other real tool to actually assess that. Um, but the direction where we're really trying to go to is human modeling. It's human modeling that can support bioequivalence in, in any, uh, in any uh, specification of differences in drug product specifications. In the future, our major focus, as you can take from the last slide, is also to increase the regulatory applic applicability of our ocular PBK models. And that works on, on 
doing research that will improve the verification of these models. Uh, we are working with different external collaborators to improve the ocular PVK models. Um, one example is with Enzyme and Transporter Corporation. Another example is the impact of blinking rate. This is a critical parameter that distinguishes rabbits and humans. Humans blink at a much, much faster rate than humans. Imagine that you're applying this drug, your drug product to the eye, and your eye's blinking. That's a very complex process, and we have to understand that dynamic to fully understand how we can predict these in humans. We also have additional internal studies that are planned to aid in our own model verification. First is with tear fill thickness and meniscus measurements on rabbit ocular surface with cyclosporin emulsion. We're doing additional uh, distribution, systemic PK, and intraocular pressure studies with brazilomyce suspension. And we're also doing in vitro permeability tests with a variety of drug substances using rabbit and human cornea and conjunctiva. We hope to publish all these results and make these information available to companies and to any of the model developers out there in the world. With that, I'd like to conclude my talk and thank everyone that has uh, participated in the Ocular PBK program within the FEGA, a variety of people that have given advice and uh, helped us along the way. In addition, I also want to thank our external collaborators who have developed these modeling platforms.